A former Apple employee who worked for the company during the launch of the iPod has admitted to helping the U.S. government develop an enhanced, secret version of the device, one with the unique ability to collect data covertly. Shayer mentioned that he first heard about the project in 2005 after being visited by his boss's boss. He was given the assignment and was asked to carry it out with his boss's knowledge. The instruction given to him was for him to assist two engineers from the U.S. Department of Energy in the construction of a special iPod and to report only to him. Apparently, both men did not actually work for the Department of Energy. They instead were from a division of Bechtel, a U.S. defense contractor to the Department of Energy. Shayer became engrossed in the project over the next several months, and he spent a lot of time working with the two men from the Department of Energy, who he identified as Paul and Matthew. Most of what he did was enable them to access secret Apple facilities, specifically the places where the iPod's development took place. He also helped them access Apple-provided source code and compile it into the iPod operating system. He also assisted them in navigating the Windows-based developer tools that were being used by Apple at the time to build software for ARM chips. He found the process of compiling the iPod operating system from source code and loading it onto an iPod quite difficult especially the testing and debugging process, but his work was far from done. He got an unused office for Matthew and Paul in the building and had the IT department at Apple reroute the Ethernet drops in the office to be only connected to the public Internet. This would keep it outside Apple's firewall and prevent them from gaining access into Apple's internal network. Though Apple was doing the government a favor, they were wary of their presence and did everything to make sure they wouldn't regret the collaboration. Only employees cleared for that building would be allowed in. Everyone who used the building would need to present an Apple badge to the Apple badge reader in order to enter the building. This presented a small problem for the duo, and to solve this, Shayer had to sign them in as guests and escort them to their respective offices. After doing this for many days, he came up with the idea to get them vendor badges, which enabled them the same rights as service providers. Apple refused to offer them hardware or software tools of any kind and only provided the specs for the ARM compiler, JTA debugger, and Windows computers they would need. They were even made to purchase the retail iPods they were going to be working on. And there were the not-so-mundane responsibilities of helping two outsiders to take Apple-provided source code and compile it into the operating system that ran what was quickly becoming perhaps the world's most iconic music-playing device. Among other things, Shayer helped the men find their way around the Windows-based developer tools Apple used at the time to build software for ARM chips. Apple did not provide the engineers with discrete access to its source code server, but instead offered them a copy of the source code on DVD with the condition that the DVD must never leave the building, although they were permitted to retain the modified copy of the OS they made. The engineers wasted no time in learning the way things worked out at Apple, as well as the technology that was being developed. This allowed them to better explain their intentions for the product and as a result to achieve their goals quickly, effectively, and most importantly, under the radar. They added special hardware to their iPod, which enabled them to generate and record data without being detected. Despite his involvement in the product, Shayer was kept in the dark about most things. He wasn't even permitted to see the hardware that was being developed, and he ultimately never got to see it. Despite their secrecy, he was always willing to offer assistance and help them decide the best way to hide the data they had recorded. Being a disk engineer, he recommended that they include a separate partition on the disk that would enable them to store the data secretly. This would mean that even when someone plugs the modified iPod into a Mac or PC, it would still be treated as a normal iPod and only people who are aware of the presence of the partition would be able to access the hidden data. This idea was well received, and they went along with it. The next task he assisted them was with the recording. They needed an uncomplicated way to record. Starting and stopping the recording process had to be seamless and unnoticeable. To solve this problem, they decided to select the deepest preference menu path and include what Sehar referred to as an innocuous sounding menu to the end. Shayer helped them to include this in the code, in a concealed way, and made sure that nothing about the device would make people who weren't in the know suspect that it was far from being a normal iPod. Although Shayer admits that he never really got to know the exact function of the device, he did notice that the engineers combined the modified OS with the strange hardware added to a fifth-generation iPod. 
The goal of this device seemed to be for it to record ambient data that would be written into the device disk without anyone realizing what is taking place. He also believed that the modified iPod would include a Geiger counter that would enable it to detect stolen uranium or possible plans for the development of a dirty bomb. The Department of Energy's oversight of nuclear weapons and programs makes this theory even more likely. Although Shayer and Tony Fidel, two reputable individuals with important ties to Apple, have claimed this account is nothing short of the truth, a number of skeptics have questioned the honesty of this account, or whether it even took place at all. Most of the people who doubt this story believed it until he mentioned that the device would be used to measure radioactivity. The idea that the modified iPod would be used to record private conversations between important targets seems much more believable. Whether or not this account is true, it is very interesting, and the idea that this occurred makes us wonder what else big tech companies are doing under the radar for the government. It's much more fun to believe that this actually happened.